All right, let's see now. Okay, there's our baby Bill Bow. Um, <clears throat> and just uh, to start, I'll talk a little bit about that since it was brought up. It was the first art museum that Frank Gehry designed. We commissioned him in 1990 before he uh, was commissioned to build the Bilbao, the Guggenheim Bilbao in um, Spain, which now has been, which made him actually the rock star of architects in the world. I think he's probably the most famous architect in the world. We, uh, living today perhaps, we worked with him in 1990, opened our museum in 1993, and for which we raised all the money to build from the private sector. No federal, no state money was involved in building it. And then in 2011, we commissioned him also to do an expansion, which we'd known we'd needed from the beginning to do an expansion of our galleries. And so he did an expansion, which we opened in 2011. Um, we call it WAM, uh, which I love because it's powerful. Um, it's Wiseman Art Museum. It's, uh, uh, people know museums by acronyms. Everybody knows in the US, at least, that who MOCA is. Uh, who, who the Met is, uh, MoMA, all that sort of thing. So we decided when we did our uh, rebranding exercise when we reopened in 2011 that we were going to go for uh, WAM because we liked the power of it. We liked um, what our branding, we, we talked about, someone talked about business and museums now being businesses. We're sort of businesses. But anyway, um, in our rebranding, we came up with our brand personality, which we decided was approachable, alive, and smart. And WAM seemed to exemplify that idea of being approachable, alive, and smart as a museum. So that's the background. Um, I've been the director there for a long time, 30 years or so. Uh, I helped raise the money for the uh, for building Frank, worked, had the privilege probably the greatest, greatest privilege of my life, working with an, an absolute genius like Frank Gehry, not once but twice. So that was really one of the best experiences of, of my whole life, I would say. Um, so advocacy, what is it? What, why, where, when? And actually, it's something that you do all the time. You do it whenever you talk about your museum and the good work it does to your friends, to your family, to your neighbors. You're the best advocates for your museum because you're the people who know what you're doing, why you're doing it, and you can talk most passionately about it. It's my experience that people who work in museums aren't there because they make a lot of money or have a lot of prestige. And certainly, um, big positions in big museums may pay well and have prestige, but for most of us in smaller organizations, we do what we do because we love it. We believe passionately in our institutions, and that's what makes us the best advocates. And I'm going to talk about advocacy with both a small a and a capital A. So the difference between uh, the advocacy you do every day, and I'm what calling advocacy is a with a capital A, uh, with a capital A it's when you talk about your museum and the good things you do uh, to people in power, in power with implement change to change things that keep you from doing your best or that will create problems for you or to provide you with more money to do your good work. And that's what I'm going to call advocacy with a capital A. Sometimes uh, people equate advocacy with lobbying, which is a dirty word in many circles in the US at least. We're always hearing about how lobbyists have undue and bad influence on our laws. And although many people use the words interchangeably, there is a technical distinction between advocacy and lobbying, though there may be, I think, a little bit of hair splitting going on here. But in the US, at least, it can make a difference whether we are advocating or lobbying. Not-for-profit organizations are governed by specific sets of rules about what they can or cannot do to directly influence legislation, which is lobbying. Uh, whereas we aren't limited in terms of advocacy, which is getting the word out about our cause and the laws that will influence it. For example, we can only use a particular percentage of our budget for lobbying. I actually think this refers uh, more for large charities that actually hire paid lobbyists than it does for museums. Most of uh, our lobbying is done actually by ourselves rather than by our big paid <laughs> lobbyists. Lobbying, as opposed to advocacy, is attempting to influence legislators to support or oppose a particular piece of legislation. 
And we certainly do this. So I think there's a very thin line between advocacy and lobbying. If advocacy is simply getting the word out about what will influence, and lobbying is trying to influence people one way or the other, I think it's a pretty thin line there. But um, I've done direct lobbying, and I don't see it as exerting undue influence. Direct lobbying is defined as communication with a legislator, legislative staff, or any legislative body, or any executive branch or government employee. Uh, the communication in lobbying refers to a specific piece of legislation and expresses a view on that legislation, pass it or don't pass it. I've done this many times, sometimes to great effect immediately, but more often, if it has any effect, it comes much later. So advocacy is defined, as I said, more generally as educating and creating awareness about, among legislators, among the general public, about what we do and the importance of the issues that we're facing, the importance of public policy to address issues and needs in our group. So I've, I've certainly done that, and uh, I've done it in terms of advocacy, but very often I have some particular point of view that I wish a legislator to support or not support. So this is uh, advocacy in its truest form as it's defined uh, legally as opposed to lobbying. But I think um, the difference, though it might not be a legal difference between advocacy and lobbying, is um, that we do as individuals lies in what I'm going to call the P words, passion and persuasion versus paid and profit. When we advocate, when you advocate, we do it out of a passion for our museums, to make our muse museums able to do better work for our communities, not out of profit. We're usually not for hire, willing to advocate or lobby for whoever will pay us. We do our work for love and not for money. I think this, though maybe not technically, puts us on a completely different footing from the paid lobbyists who have such a bad reputation. Not to mention that I happen to believe that museums are good for our communities in ways that the tobacco industry, which has a lot of paid lobbyists, is not. And this is not to say that businesses are not good for our communities or that the economy isn't important, because it is. But I believe that museums offer a different kind of good, and that's another thing that makes our efforts different. We aren't lobbying for rules or laws that will let us make more lobby, more money. We're lobbying for rules or laws that will allow us to offer better <laughs> services to our communities. And to me, that's a big difference that separates us from the pack. This doesn't mean that we're naive about laws or processes, but it does mean that we're mission-driven, not profit-driven. Not profit so I'm going to talk about four things that, that are required to make advocacy or lobbying on behalf of museums work doing good work, being informed, taking individual action, and organizing group action. Perhaps the most important thing you can do to provide a basis for advocacy or lobbying is to do great work in your museums. And I mean that. You must be clear about why your museum exists and who it's trying to serve. To be a truly viable museum in the 21st century, you have to be fully engaged in your community and provide resources that fulfill the needs of your constituents. This requires institutional alignment of your goals with the realities of your visitor expectations, motivations, and needs. You must have people in your community who believe passionately in what you do to serve them and will speak up for you when you need them to. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked to speak to presidents of small museums around the United States, um, uh, to small universities around the United States on behalf of their university museums, because I'm at a university museum and that's where my experience is. I've been asked in a very real sense to advocate for these museums. In cases most recently, it's maybe because the administration has decided to sell the collection or close the museum, and that's a whole another issue we could spend uh, talking, a lot of time talking about. But I have to tell you that in most of these cases, the decision has been made because the museum is not, it's not been doing a good job. It hasn't been serving its community and basically has no support. And so it's really hard to advocate on behalf of institutions who've held themselves aloof 
and who have no other voices to speak to them, speak for them, except someone like me, who's been called in from the outside. So the first thing I think you need to do when you're thinking about advocacy with both a small A and the big A is to assess what you're doing to serve your communities and engage your communities. Do a self-assessment exercise to make sure you know what you're doing and who your friends are. Do you have a list of teachers who will uh, talk about how well you've worked with them if that's called for? Do you have people in your community that you know will talk about the importance of the exhibits or the educational work that you do for their community if you need them to? Have you made yourself essential to your community? And who would be, besides yourself, willing to say that? A great example of this is a film, a small film I'm going to show you at the end if there's time. Um, it's called Spark. You can Google Spark Philadelphia Museums, and I'm going to try to show this to you at the end. Because a museum organization made this very cheaply by gathering together groups of their visitors and filming them talking about their experiences in the museums. So it's a great piece of advocacy, and I'll show it at the end. <coughs> so now you have your information, your assessment, and it's true that you are doing good work. You know that you are, and you have people to say that. So now you have to be able to articulate, articulate it. I'm going to go back, because we're not quite there yet. Oops. I don't know what I did. I hit something wrong here. There we go. So I happen to believe that art, uh, passionately, that art is essential to the human experience. And this vision drives our museum, and we try to make ourselves essential to our community, our students, and our university. To be a great advocate, I believe you have to have a great passion, and you have to be able to articulate it rationally, but passionately. You need to be able to make believers of others. Make them believers as well, so that when you need them to help support you, when action threatens you, or if something is needed to be done that would improve your museum, they'll be willing to step forward. So I guess what I'm saying in the end is that great leadership is essential to making great museums. And great museums inspire people to support us when we need it. So before you can engage effectively in advocacy, you need to have a museum that you know is doing great work, a museum that you can believe in and that you can convince other people to believe in. You have to be able to talk about it in a way that people who might not even ever have been there can be engaged to come and to believe in it. So I think the ma another major difference between paid lobbyists and museum advocates is like the difference between crusaders and paid mercenaries. We advocate because we love it, because we believe in our cause, not because we're paid to fight on its behalf. This doesn't mean we don't need paid lobbyists, because we do, but I think they serve a different purpose. And that purpose is being informed, knowing what is going on. That's where the paid lobbyists come in. I belong to several museum organizations, and two of them have paid lobbying staff, government affairs officials. My university has a government affairs office, too. So a good part of what they do is to stay informed about issues that are going on that affect museums, and they also need to stay informed about what museums are doing. Of course, we advocate or lobby the government to all allocate more money, um, though we have very few national organizations that support the arts, the NEA, the NEH, the IMLS, and a few others. But most museums in the United States are private museums, not government museums, private with a, a small p. Um, so um, there's some money to be had from the, from the federal and state governments, and we do uh, lobby and advocate on behalf of getting more money. But perhaps more importantly, our government affairs officers keep us informed on other kinds of issues. Sometimes there are issues that are really on the periphery of our vision um, as museum workers, but may have great unintended or unknown implications for us. And I want to give you just a couple of concrete examples. One of the things I've been involved in is lobbying about the unintended consequence of a US law that prohibits artists from taking a tax deduction for works of art. That's more than just the cost of materials. I know that laws are different here, and this may not affect you, but I give it as an example of a kind of um, 
of an, of an issue that we weren't on the ball about and has affected us quite a lot in the ensuing years. So prior to the Tax Reform Act of 1969, visual artists, writers, or music composers could deduct the fair market value of the works of art that they contributed to charities qualified to receive them, such as libraries, museums, and galleries. Not to give their work to um, a hospital for resale, but to a museum for exhibition. But since 1969, the deduction has been limited to the actual cost basis of the work, that is, the amount the artist spent to create it. So the added value of the creative input is completely ignored. Um, the reason this happened is actually pretty galling to me as a museum person. It happened because in 1969, President Nixon donated his vice presidential papers to a library and took a tax deduction claiming they were worth half a million dollars. The, in the fallout, legislation was passed that does this limitation uh, to the cost of materials, which is generally nominal. So an artist can give a painting to a friend, and the friend can donate it and take a deduction based on the fair market value. But if the artist, him or herself, donates it, they can deduct, she or he can deduct the cost of paint and canvas. Doesn't seem quite fair. So you can imagine that for many museums, such as mine, and particularly contemporary museums, uh, this immediately re reduced donations of works of art because they um, depended on the artist to donate these works of art, particularly to contemporary museums. So the initial legislation was supposed to stop individuals from taking deductions based on an unrealistic evaluation, as President Nixon did. But we all know there are certainly ways to ensure that an artist whose work sells for $200 doesn't get to take a $200,000 tax deduction. But in the haste to cover this loophole in the tax laws, the legislation simply banned all deductions except for the actual cost of the paper and ink or the paint and the canvas. If museums had been aware that this was going on at the time and taken action to propose to the people who were, who were doing this legislation of the unintended consequences and ways to avoid those, the situation might have been different. Now it's very hard to get it changed. And I've been working unsuccessfully on this for many years. And even though we pr propose legislation that would prevent fraud, it's been to no avail. I doubt we'll get it changed in the near future, but it's really affected us and small museums without funds to art. This is an example of how if we'd been better organized and had known about the issues, we might not find ourselves in this situation today. Another issue that's been better handled, because we are better organized and better informed than we were in 1969, is the very well, or are the very well intended regulations about ivory. In response to concerns that the poaching of African elephants for ivory is rapidly driving the species to extinction, the American Fish and Wildlife Service issued an order in 2014 that tightened, tightened import, export, and sale of elephant ivory. Who would think that museums should be watching the Fish and Wildlife Service to see what their regulations were? Fortunately, the government affairs offices of our major museum organizations were, and we were able to prevent most of the un unintended consequences of this blanket prohibition. While we wanted to support the protection of endangered species, we were, were able to get some excep exceptions that address areas of concern. For example, the acquisition of antique works of, uh, made of ivory and exhibits and loans of ivory objects uh, transporting international lines. While the regulations initially had a chilling effect, as they're better understood and better enforced, the situation is straightening out. We were able to, to, um, to avoid the worst situations for museums because we were informed. We were, had people who were watching all areas of the government and informed us what was coming and what we needed to do about it. They called on those museums most affected to testify and helped us educate regulators of the inintend, unintended consequences. Musical organizations, such as the American Symphony Orchestra League, also issued calls to their members, informing them about what this ban could do in terms of concert tours 
and musicians who were taking their instruments who might have had small bits of ivory on the keys or on the bows of violins and this sort of thing, uh, taking their instruments in and out of the country. So while we as individuals are responsible for creating institutions that are community values, we do need the help of people whose main job it is to be watchers, to keep us informed of unintended consequences from the actions of all areas of government, local and um, state and federal. <coughs> the, um, <coughs> the Art Museum Directors Association that I belong to has in its members' website a section on advocacy that informs its members on a um, number of, of issues. Of, of issues, you can see um, that you can go <clears throat> to all of these sections and get more more definite, more more uh, detailed information on what to do. It has a section on hot topics, so uh, it tells you what's coming up, what you need to be alert to. Of course, tax law in the United States is always a big issue for museums because, because being so dependent on private donations, the idea that we don't get money from the government, but we do get a benefit from individuals giving money to museums because they can uh, take it as a tax deduction is extremely important that we keep these. And as our government changes and moves in different directions, people are always wanting to bring in more money by um, doing away with the charitable deductions. So this is something that we are now watching constantly, and all charities are involved in, in this. And it also, um, the websites inform us of international issues that affect museums. <coughs> and some of these are cultural property and are, uh, archaeological materials, laws, um, foreign sovereign immunity that you can't, uh, whether or not you can sue uh, for an exhibition that's lent, a government can be sued for an exhibition that's lent to an, a museum in the United States, uh, even though it has immunity from seizure and restitution related to the Holocaust. When I was chair of the AAMD, which is the Art Museum Directors Association Government Affairs Committee, I worked closely with museums around the country and with our paid professionals on issues around the Holocaust and Nazi looted art. I met with representatives of Jewish organizations to hear their concerns and tell them what we were doing. I organized meetings on the statewide level so that I would know what museums in our area were actually doing. And there was a great move for provenance research. And there were actually some foundations that we persuaded to fund museums who couldn't afford it to do provenance research into their collections. I testified before a US Senate committee, along with the director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York, about what American museums were doing to discover works of art in our collections that might have been looted by the Nazis, later sold, and donated to our collections. I well remember uh, that one congressperson, one senator, decided that uh, the legislature should form, the federal legislature should form a committee to investigate this issue. Well, it seemed to me this was a typical federal response. Let's form another committee to investigate it. Just what we need, another committee to have to deal with. I was able in response, because I was educated, had educated myself, and had been educated by our paid government affairs officials, to tell them what museums were already doing. And they were persuaded that we didn't need a committee to do more than that. Of course, there were exceptions. But in this case, most museums in the US were actually already doing a lot in terms of provenance research to discover these works of art. And I was able to persuade them that government help wasn't necessary. So being informed uh, of all of what museums were doing, we were able to prevent yet another cumbersome government regulation and cumbersome committee. Because I was an active professional, I was able to make our case much more believably than a paid professional. Though, of course, I depended on those paid professionals from our museum organizations who knew the legislative process in much more depth than I did. They, did the they helped do the national resource, helped me put together my testimony so that I was informed. So in the end, it's a partnership. We must be well informed as professionals to make our case 
but we all need those paid professionals who in our case are in our na nation's capital, who know what's going on and alert us when we need to take action. They tell us when we need to write letters, when we need to appear in person. They can do the research that we often have little time to do. They can help us prevent those unintended consequences by helping us make our positions known sooner rather than later. But <clears throat> there's nothing that will ever replace, no paid professional, I don't think, can ever replace the passionate individual making a case for his or her museum. This isn't only at the federal level, but at the local level uh, as well, and I mean the really local level. One of the cardinal <coughs> rules of advocacy is that you can't make friends when you need friends. You need to make friends now so that you can call on them when you need them. You need those lists of teachers now. You need those lists of visitors who love your museum now so that when you need them, you aren't starting from scratch. If you have a membership organization, those members are already your advocates, and you can call on them, call on them when you need to write letters to your local newspaper or call members of your local council. In this case, their words will even have a much greater impact than yours because they're your users. They're not people who have a vested interest except in terms of being members of your community who care about what you're doing for them. You can provide templates for letters or emails, but you need to urge each advocate to add something individual, something wonderful that your museum did for them. Refer to some wonderful service or experience they received from your museum. So here's an example of a really local advocacy effort. I have an advisory board. Because I'm part of a university, I don't have a governing board because I'm governed by our university, part of a big bureaucracy. Um, I, but I knew that I needed advocates in our community outside the university, even to help me make my case within the university, because we are so huge. We have a community of 65,000, which includes students, faculty, and staff. So it's a huge university, and we're a tiny little part of it. So um, in 1984, we started this organization, our advisory board. And so now I know that I have people who are educated about our mission and who are willing to help me make my case, even to my boss at the university. For example, in 1990, when we wanted to be allowed to start a fundraising campaign in our community to build a new museum facility, we had to get permission from the university, who didn't want us going sort of wild in the streets um, raising money. Fortunately, we had friends from our organization that we'd started in 1984 who understood the need and who understood the dream. They went with me to the university administration, and that helped make it clear that it wasn't just one person, just me, who believed in this. It was a lot of people. I took not too many, so that the university president felt that he was being ganged up on, but three people who were influential in the community and who were donors to the university in other areas, not just friends of the museum. And it worked. We were allowed to start our fundraising campaign, we were successful, and we built our uh, new art museum that opened in 1993. So that was advocacy at its simplest and most basic and most local form, even within my own organization. Our national organizations tell us, get to know your lawmakers. Ask to visit their offices when you're in the Capitol. They'll meet with you because you're a constituent and a voter. Maybe they won't meet with you in person, but they'll probably assign a staff member to meet with you. Be respectful of, this, of the time and be prepared, be organized, to talk about the most important issues you want to inform them about. Be prepared with information about what you do for your community and the people and schools and the other key groups you serve. Of course, it's always better if you know the legislator personally. And a way that I found is good to do this is to be active in groups outside your museum. Being old is now an advantage for me in the Capitol because uh, I know personally a number of our legislators. I knew them for years before they were elected. Uh, because we were both members of some women's organizations. I've served on public art committees with them for our state. And so, of course, because they know me, because they knew me before, they'll always make an effort to see me. 
So to be a good advocate means more than just being a good leader for your museum. It means that you need to participate in the life of your community in other ways. Get yourself out there and meet people. Cast your bread upon the waters is what my mother always told me, and it will come back to you. The actual quote from the Old Testament, I believe, is cast your bread upon the waters for you shall find it after many days. So you don't know when it's going to come back to you, but it will come back to you. A couple of years ago, I'll tell you an example, I was in Washington for a conference, um, not uh, to particularly to advocate, but just I was going for a conference. And so I, I decided to stay an extra day and to make appointments to see one Senate member and one House of Representatives member, both of whom I'd known for a long time before they were elected to our national government. So I was in um, Betty McCollum, was our representative from our regions, uh, office to talk about the federal government increasing the limit on federally funded insurance for very valuable uh, loans to traveling exhibitions. So our government has a plan so that if you're bringing in a high value exhibit, you can apply to have the government insure part of the value, and I think you have that here too. However, um, it was woefully out of date in terms of the total value limit that could be insured at any one point. The value of artworks had gone uh, up, and the maximum value the government would insure hadn't gone up, so we needed to get that limit raised. So I was talking to one of Betty's top assistants, she wasn't uh, available, and I mentioned that this was an issue of concern, and I said I hoped that Betty would support raising the limit. Oh, he said, well, she'll be going to a hearing about it this afternoon, and if you can give me some language right now, I'll have her put it on the table as a motion. So, needless to say, the person from our uh, government, uh, from our, the government affairs official I called, and we got to work right then and there on some specific language, and we had the language to the staffer within an hour, and Betty introduced it that afternoon, and it was passed. Now, of course, this was a coincidence, and, but if I hadn't made the appointment, it wouldn't have happened. If our government affairs uh, staff officer hadn't briefed me specifically about what to ask for and what the limit was that we wanted, uh, I might not have urged this particular point. If I hadn't known Betty through other activities, I wouldn't have had credibility. So it was because I was a credible representative of an institution that this, this uh, legislative person knew and respected, it happened. If I hadn't cast my bread upon the waters, and asked Betty to come to the museum when I first met her as head of a local agency um, before she ran for office, it wouldn't have happened. So that's the power of the individual and that's the power of getting out in your community and meeting people. This happened at a national issue, as a national issue, but you can do it on the local level as well. You can do it within your museum, your city, your region, be out there, be collaborative, cast your bread up on the waters and it will come back when you need it. So I've been talking about individuals mostly and advocacy in its broadest terms, and now I'm going to final, my final point is to organize and take grassroots action. And this is the kind of thing that museum organizations can do, like the Museums and Galleries of Scotland. Museum organizations have been helping individual organizations create documents that will make the case to their cities, regions, and national governments. And one of the leaders in this has been the AAM, or the American Alliance of Museums. It helps us, um, at first it, its website tells us um, what we can do, invite Congress to visit your museum, uh, tell Congress to support full funding, all these kinds of things. Um, and it helps us create an economic impact statement for each museum. And uh, this is uh, its national economic impact statement, $21 billion a year, uh, the amount uh, museums contribute to the US economy annually. But um, I personally think maybe museums have relied a little bit too much on economic impact. So I like a little bit better the educational impact charts that have been created by the uh, more specific organization, the art museum directors. And this is the, um, it's a little hard to see, 
but this is the economic impact they created for the only art museums, the three art museums in the state of Minnesota. And you can see um, the Twin Cities there has got, of course, the most, but all throughout the state. These are schools that our art museums have impacted directly with our programs. And that's a really powerful tool. And here is um, economic demographic, another economic demographic impact map that they created for, um, for our, just our Twin Cities region. And you can see they talk about the uh, impact of, uh, that we've made in, in uh, regions of our city that have different um, economic demographics. They use a particular mapping software that um, I was told has a UK version. And so you, you, if you send, if I send them um, the list of schools that we've served, they can then put it into the software and it will create this mapping tool, which I think is really, um, as I say, I think it has more impact at this point than the, um, than the economic impact. I think that um, these kinds of things are particularly important because a lot of people still think that museums are treasure houses for the elite, art museums particularly. And I think even some people who work in art museums still think that too, unfortunately. But um, these kinds, of, these kinds of, of things can help you break down that. Uh, Stephen Weil, who some of you have probably read, who was a lawyer and deputy director of the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington, when I first knew him and was later a scholar at the Center for Museum Studies at the <laughs> Smithsonian, I think said it best when he wrote an article in 1999 enti uh, entitled, From Being About Something to Being For Someone, The Ongoing Transformation of the American Museum. And I think that really puts it the best. And I think these kinds of charts talk about who we're for. Uh, more and, and, are, and are more, have more impact than maybe showing the treasures uh, of our collections. I think that we are able to make more of an impact uh, to convince people who have power over us that we're not just for a few rich people, uh, that we are for people all over our state and people at all levels of demographics. Whoops, I hit the wrong thing again. There, there we go. <coughs> um, I just have one funny little example um, that I want to that I want to tell you about. That I know that that most many museums here are not what we would call private museums. That they're they're more government museums. But I did my PhD research at the British uh, Library in London on an organization called the London Art Union. Years um, who's a 19th century Victorian, typical Victorian do-gooder organization. And their main goals were, quote, to raise the level of taste in the masses and to, uh, <laughs> and to, to promote British artists. And I didn't know I was going to be a museum person when I did this research, but uh, they were very involved in supporting museums. And I remember being astounded when I found out in one of their reports that um, it was about the mid-19th century that the British Museum removed the requirement that you had to sign a guest book when you came in. Uh, it was always free, it was supported by the government, but you had to sign the guest book. Well, when they took off that requirement, attendance quadrupled in one year. And that was because all those people who couldn't write were too embarrassed to put an X, so they just didn't go to museums. So uh, it was interesting, as the century went on and gaslighting came in, they made moves to have museums open in the evenings so the working class could come. And they advocated for having cemeteries open to the public rather than being private, because that's where they thought people could see great sculpture. I thought that was interesting. And then there were these wonderful petitions that I wrote, read about to get museums to, quote, hang up little pieces of paper next to the painting to tell the artist and the date and something about it. <laughs> and to arrange the works of art by artist or chronology rather than by size. So it's interesting, the evolution of museums, even the museums that are publicly supported rather than private museums, haven't always been uh, for someone. They've been more about something. So starting in 2009, the American Alliance of Museums have promoted a National Advocacy Day, urging museums across the United States to come to Washington on the same day to uh, visit their senators and representatives 
And we, this is done um, at the state level, too. We have an advocacy day in Minnesota, where we go to our state capital, and they have them in many other states. The um, organization takes on the, um, the museum organization takes on organizing and, and dividing people and, and uh, making appointments for them and giving them talking points. You can see they've been doing this for a number of years. Um, this, is, um, this is one in the, uh, Colorado. These are some um, materials that they've uh, uh, done more recently. This is uh, 2015, the recap of what they accomplished. Um, and this is their program. They have a mass breakfast. They give us a pep talk. They divide us into groups. And we uh, all go around in the same day and meet with people. Um, and this is um, uh, uh, coming up with some, some, some shots from their website that tell you how extensive this program is that they organize. You can see it's really a big program. It's um, a great effort. And the people who participate, this is advocacy. They rarely try to get their legislators to take action on specific issues. They're simply there to so, show the strength of the sector. Um, they're there to persuade their legislators of what they do for their communities. And that they persuade the, their legislators that if they support museums, they'll be supporting the people who vote for them in the end. So these efforts work, I think. And I think that they work as much to get the participants energized and to give them confidence to take individual action later. Because if you've never done this, it can be a little bit scary to go to your capital and meet with your legislator on a one-to-one -one basis. But if you first go with a group of people from your region and you know that you're going to get a positive response, it takes a little bit of the fear away so that when you go on your own the next time, you aren't intimidated. And here are just some of the people uh, who have participated in this effort. You can see that they're all different ages. and. <clears throat> That's Ford Bell, who was the chair of the um, alliance. These are at some of the informational meetings. And these are some photographs uh, from museum websites of their representatives in meeting with their legislators in Washington. So we'll come to the chicken painting in a minute. I want to leave you with the idea that while grassroots organized mass efforts can be effective, the most effective advocates are still individuals. Individuals who are close to museums and who can express their passion articulately and in human terms. Those are the best advocates. And I want to give you um, an example of something that happened two weeks ago. I was asked to come to Washington two weeks ago by our senator, Amy Klobuchar, whom I've known through women's organizations in Minnesota for a long time before she was elected to come and speak about the value of arts, a basic advocacy effort. There were four of us on the panel, and I was the only one representing museums. The other ones were from theaters uh, and musical organizations. So um, for an hour, we met with senators. And then an hour later, we went and met with a group from the House of Representatives. So I chose in my three to five minutes uh, to talk about three things out of the many that we do that I felt would really resonate with the people I was talking to. One was work with our memory loss patients. Alzheimer's disease has touched so many people in the last 10 years. Nearly everybody has a parent or a friend who has a spouse who suffers. They know the anguish, and they know how important it is to bring comfort to both patients and caregivers alike. So I talked about the program we have for caregivers and patients in our galleries and the light that goes on in the patient's and the caregiver's eyes when they respond to a work of art. And I talked about how we're trying to extend this through Skype to people who physically can't leave their residencies or their homes. I talked about our work with our medical school at the university, uh, training beginning medical students in close observation skills. A radiologist once told me, that reading a scan was very much like looking at a work of art, at a painting. You have to know a little history, or at least it helps. You have to be able to see the whole, but then you also have to look at the details and put it all together. Your knowledge of history, the whole, and the part make a complete diagnosis, 
or make a complete work of art. You have to do this when you're working with a patient. So I talked about our program with our medical school. Everybody goes to a doctor. And so using art museums to train better doctors strikes a chord in everyone. I gave an example of our literacy program that I think is so powerful. We have a program called Artful Writing. We're, very, we're a small museum, and so we can't offer visits, mass visits to old masters to every fifth grader in our school district. What we can do is work with three to five schools a year to train their teachers to use experiences with works of art to help their students improve communication skills, oral and written. So we bring students from these schools for three visits, and we raise money to provide buses to bring the kids to the schools because the schools can't afford them. So I told the senators about Alston, a kid from an inner city school, and what I heard in front of a painting that we call the chicken painting, which is here. And there's Alston and his teacher, and we actually have a recording of this. So Alston was using our uh, program, their artful writing program, to try to get, or the teacher was using this to try to get Alston to make a meaning from this painting. And he was a kid from an inner city school who'd never been to an art museum before, and they're standing in front of the painting. And she's, first of all, trying to get him just to describe it. What do you see? Well, you see this chicken farm. And if you're an artist, you know about the power of one-point perspective, which you absolutely see there. And so Alston is talking, and he says, oh, this artist is crazy. It's, it, there's nothing. There's nothing here. There's not, you, you know, it's just that the artist is crazy, and he made this painting. And she keeps going on. And she keeps getting Alston to talk about it and look about it and look at it. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you could sort of feel the light go on. And Alston said, I know. It's like a slave ship. Which was, gives me chills even today when I think about it. Because all of a sudden, this kid, who'd never seen a work of art before in his life, made a meaning from a painting that drew on his knowledge of history, that drew on what he was seeing, that drew on looking at the whole, that drew on looking at the individual parts. And I hope, I hope it changed his life. I think maybe it did. Now I'm gonna conclude by showing you this wonderful, wonderful thing. But um, all I can say in conclusion is that you can do it. You can do it on a local level. You need to make a connection a human connection, the power of your museum to your community, asking people for help to do what you do shouldn't be hard if you really believe in it. Whether it's allowing for ivory icons to be in a traveling exhibit, or whether it's giving money to support you. Whatever the issue, you're the best person to convince people in power of its, person, of its importance to your museum, you and your constituents. So maybe it's like convincing my university that we needed an art museum where all students could learn to love art, to have an equal opportunity to become an art fan as they have to become a football fan. Maybe it's convincing your elementary school officials that an art museum can help kids learn to write better or politicians to fund buses. But you can do it. It's advocacy. We can all do it. And if we believe in what we're doing, as you must or you wouldn't be here today, you can do it too. So now I'm gonna turn you to this wonderful, if I can get this to work, might need some help, this wonderful little film on YouTube. Why didn't you tell me now the story? I was thinking about this concept of people's memory being like a, like a string of pearls. Every vacation I've ever gone on involved going to a museum. Loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. My daddy brought me up to to look at the wonder world of science. Wow! I got lost. But of course I wasn't lost at all. I was exactly where I wanted to be. Have you been to the Munner Museum? Franklin Institute. The zoo. The Civil War Museum of Philadelphia. The Art Museum, surely. I mean, it's our jewel. And what I remember most is not being tall enough to see a work of art, but getting lifted by my father so I could look. <gasps> a bridge would suddenly come into view, and I just thought this was magic. It seemed very audacious and sexy. And it was my first encounter with Brie. And I thought, this is like a church for play. And then you turn the crank and water blasts out of the top. Well, they get to be kids. 
Nobody tells them they can't do things. Oh, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a pilot. You're suddenly swept up in the reality of this very distant world. The thunder of the hooves of the horses is something they can almost hear. You got this incredible sense of the sound and motion. And I felt that I could hear the wind. To wonder how anybody can create something from a thought. Okay, is that like the greatest thing in the whole world? The answer is yes. I want to be engaged, so I walk up to the artwork and I say, please engage me. I'm here, I'm ready, I'm willing, you know, I'm ready to do some work, give me something to work on. <laughs> Surprise me. But then I went to that exhibit and I like totally changed my mind about microbes. There's this museum in Philadelphia, you have to go. The Academy of Fine Arts. The Rosenbach. The Independent Seaport Museum. I'd go to the Constitution Center. Oh, the Rodin. I love to go and be inspired. And I'd look at the whole room and then I'd stop with them and I'd sit down and I'd stare at them for about 10 or 15 minutes. Like every time I went in the gallery, I kept coming back to it. It's going back to an old friend. Man, if she didn't come out that picture and just touch me on my shoulder. And she had her head up in the air, very proud. I have been going to the Mutter Museum for the past 18 years to uh, pay a visit to, uh, to a skeleton. I don't think there's anywhere else in the country you'd see anything like that. And it led to a lot of conversation. They're looking at these exhibits, they're saying, what happened to that guy? What is this bone I found, or what is this rock? What was that artist thinking when he, when he painted this brush stroke? Why? Are we here? Yeah, but that all pervades the body and soul too because it's all electromagnetic forces that hold it all together and make it all work. It doesn't matter what it is. You let go and then the ball goes over. The tiny little scientist in me was born. Yeah, I think about it. I don't know where curiosity comes from, but I think curiosity has something to do with, uh, with what you perceive. She said, let's go to the Arboretum. I said to the what? The Morris Arboretum. Adults and children suddenly say, look how blue the sky is. The Chanticleer. Longwood Gardens. It rolls, it moves, it's, it's like a song. These gigantic, humongous, two-story two tall bugs. In a world of, uh, of telephone conversations and digitized images, the encounter with the real is where we reaffirm our own reality. I really like, we have death masks. <laughs> Seeing the wampum belt. And to realize that the hands of the artist actually touched the piece that I was looking at. You were somehow breathing the same air. It's a step back in time. I just felt that, that I, I was there. The acknowledgement that history is real, that it was alive. What are my choices today? And what are my challenges? People make history yet we all can do it. He was just a common guy, but man, look what he left behind. Desert Island artwork. Oh gosh. <laughs> Desert Island work of art. Just one? Yeah. I like Jasper Johns. Marcel Duchamp's new Descending the Staircase. My Bob Dylan library. Matisse comes to mind. <laughs> the gray Twombly chalkboard. My Lincoln book collection, if I could take it. Why is it important to have a place for your soul? Oh my Gosh. Well, being in the present is a challenge. I get so involved in it that nothing else in my life matters when I'm there. My bad thoughts, like, had just cleared my mind. You can learn something about yourself, and you can also, there's a way for you to connect to other people. Zane and I basically, you know, spend many weekends at the, uh, at the museums. With George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, the suits of mail and armor and all that. What other kind of art did you like to see last time we were there? Well, the Dada Art. Yay, we're going to a museum! Sit, think, talk, visit with each other. Slow it down. Five generations on this one little carousel. It doesn't matter how old you are, what race you are. People from all walks of life, all educational backgrounds, come together and have an experience. Museums are a spark. Boing. To a cathedral of space. Peace. Creativity. Curiosity. Inspiration. Enrichment. I just want to learn more. Well, it's funny because the thing that I really loved, and they took it out. Said it's catching a meal. So you better stay away from it. Gosh, heck, it's not a door at all. It's the gates of hell. A hundred foot long recreation of the pits of Le Mans. It's Wharton Ashrick. The Wagner Free Institute. Please touch. The Barnes Foundation. The Mercer Museum. The Atwater Kent. The African American Museum. The American Philosophical Society. I have to say, I also love the boat building shop at the Seaport Museum. That translates into form following function with 
beautiful racy cars. We're getting off topic again. I told you we're getting off topic. Museums are places where I think dreams are kept. They decomplicate your mind. I think it definitely gives you a new set of eyes. How can I go wrong looking at this? I can't. Wow, that was really great. When I'm gone, this will still be there. Beauty doesn't disappear. You know, without museums, I just can't imagine what the world would be like. I really love Chuck Close's it work. It blows my mind. There's, There's really no way I could ever In a way that I never had thought of. I think it might be Van Gogh's see. Star Night. I night. love the twists of the sky. Pop I art, big, the huge whips. Nothing else I'd ever Prometheus seen. It was found. funny. And I was trying uh, to a magical place. This moose was looking out at me from Alaska. Sitting in a big concrete chair. There were like paintings inside of a painting. Diane. Harvest, confused in awe really of these How that inspirational. This How did he do that? Thank you very much. Yeah.